Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. My name is Matt Dumas. Great to see you guys again this weekend. You know, I'm sure that all of us have experienced life kind of knocking us down at one point or another. That all of us know the reality of heartbreak, of frustration, of disappointment. You know, for a lot of us, maybe it started when you were a little kid and you didn't get the toy you wanted for Christmas or for your birthday, and uh, maybe it just kind of snowballed from there and, and you uh, didn't get picked first for the team, for the, the dodgeball team or the kickball team, and, and maybe as you got older, there are other disappointments that came along in your life, other frustrations, uh, maybe relationships didn't work out the way you thought that they would. Um, maybe uh, you wanted to get the job that was the ideal job or the school that you wanted to get into and, and that didn't work out for you either. And, and maybe now you're a parent and maybe the, your, your kids, you looked at the decisions that they're making or maybe a grandparent and they're making some really bad choices and, and those choices, they just continue and on and on and, and you feel that frustration in the moment. And sometimes it's because of the things, the poor choices that you've made. You know, maybe that uh, you've said or done something that, that uh, you knew that you shouldn't. Maybe that you weren't quite prepared for that moment when the moment came and so, so it passed you by. Maybe it was laziness or procrastination that, that caused that disappointment in your life. Whatever it might be, you find yourself flat on your back, looking up, wondering what in the world just happened to me. And you have two choices. You can either get up and press on, or you can give up and you can go home. And it reminds me of this quote from a guy named Theodore Roosevelt. You may have heard of him before. It goes like this. <clears throat> it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. I love that quote. Today we're going to see as Paul, we continue our story in the book of Acts, we're going to see Paul literally get knocked down in the little city of Lystra and get back up. Please turn to Acts chapter 14 and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and for the opportunity to, to worship you, to be in your house. And Lord, as we, uh, I, I love seeing roses on this stage and the, the new life that, that uh, these two kids have found in Jesus. And Lord, we always want to celebrate that. But we also have uh, uh, this week some tragedy that's happened with uh, the Blackburn family and the passing of Robert and... Lord, we mourn for that. But Father, we don't mourn as those who have no hope because we know that he is in your presence today. And Father, for the, the Saul family, um, six kids that are without a mom today because of a car wreck. And the reminder that how fleeting life is on this planet. And that how quickly it can change from a really good day to a really bad day. And Father, a reminder that when we place our hope in vain things, it really can bring no long-term satisfaction that, that truly we're, faced, we're running after the wind. That the only hope we have is in Jesus who has already conquered death and who provides life to those who believe in him. And Father, I pray that we would live as a people who have a hope and that it would be contagious to the world around us. And as we spend time in your word today, Lord, I pray that you would 
Use it to, to uh, challenge us and to provoke us, uh, Lord, to make us more like Jesus. I pray your spirit has freedom to move. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's take a look at verse 8. At Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Laconian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without a witness. And that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. So last week, Paul and Barnabas faced both acceptance and opposition in the ancient city of Lystra, I mean of Iconium, sorry, we'll talk about Lystra today, in Iconium, that when Paul went to the synagogue and he told them about Jesus, that the crowds, at first, they were super excited, there was a super positive response that many trusted in Jesus, both Greeks and Jews, but then opposition came, and it came from a somewhat unlikely source. It were those who refused to believe in Jesus. And sadly, the ones who refused to believe were the ones that should have been the most excited about accepting him. They were Jews who had denied their Messiah. And so instead of it being the greatest news ever, received with the greatest excitement ever, it became something that was received with hostility and extreme prejudice. Having been run out of Iconium, Paul and Barnabas head approximately 18 miles down the street to a place called Lystra. Now, Lystra was, well, it was a smaller town. It was a um, kind of a frontier-type town. It, it uh, I don't know, I think of Wild West, right? It was like Wild West. It, it had a, a lot less uh, structure to it. Uh, the people there... Um, I don't know, frontier, they, uh, mob rule was kind of the, uh, the name of the game there. If they were there, you could still sense the Greek presence. So, so this was an area where the, the Greeks ha, had, had conquered at one point. It was still very Greek uh, in feel there. Most of the folks were uneducated. They spoke a local dialect called Lacaonian, but they also understood Greek. Because although the Romans ruled the land, the Greeks controlled the marketplace. And as far as we can tell, Luke mentions no synagogue, and there's no evidence of a synagogue anywhere in the city. Which means that the, the Jew, Jews had little to no influence on the spiritual welfare of this city. It was thoroughly pagan, 100% pagan. There was a temple to Zeus just outside the city limits, and the folks worship both Zeus and Hermes as their primary gods, which again tells us it's a, a very Greek place. Another fun fact that Lystra is the place where a guy named Timothy comes from. So if you're reading your Bible in the New Testament, you come across these First and Second Timothy, that's the same Timothy that he and his mother Lois and his grandmother Eunice came from Lystra. With no synagogue to start in, Paul begins preaching to folks who are gathered. Now, they might have, might have been in a local marketplace. They might have been in the town center. They could have been outside the, the temple of Zeus. But the folks are gathered there. And so Paul begins to tell them about Jesus, about the hope that there's there. And as he does, he notices there's a lame man in the audience. 
And Luke tells us when he's describing this guy, he says uh, basically his, his feet don't work. And he's been this way since birth, that he's never, ever, 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 ever walked. And it reminds us of the lame man that was at the temple gates uh, in Jerusalem back in Acts chapter 3 when Peter and John were going to the temple. This guy had never walked. He sat there day after day. And and as he listens to Paul, he believes. And Paul, looking at him, sees his faith. He says, stand upright on your feet. I guess what the guy does when Paul says that. He stands upright, right? He jumps to his feet. I mean, he's so excited. He jumps to his feet, and he begins to walk around. Now, I don't know. We can't really imagine that. I don't think that unless you've been in that situation, what it would be like never to have walked before, but not only walking, but you're jumping around. And how awesome that would have been. A a miracle truly has happened. God has done something supernatural for this man. I would argue it wasn't just one miracle, though. I would say it was two miracles. One is pretty obvious. The second one's not quite as obvious. You see, often in the Gospels when Jesus would heal somebody, their physical healing was was a picture, was a a mirror of what was happening inside, right? That, That he was healing them spiritually, which means that they were coming to faith spiritually, and then physically there was a healing that took place. You see, because the lame man's greatest need wasn't to walk. And you might say, well, wait a minute. No, this guy hasn't walked since birth. Of course his greatest need is to walk. No, that wasn't his greatest need. His greatest need was Jesus. That was his greatest need. And that guy recognized that day that his greatest need was Jesus. And when he believed in Jesus, Paul sees the faith and he says, okay, this guy has it. And he asks him to stand up, and he does. That faith to be made well wasn't just a physical healing. It was also a spiritual healing. And the folks that are gathered, the crowds, they rightly um, recognize something supernatural has happened. They know this guy. He's part of the town. He's one of the locals. They see him day in and day out. So they know that this is a guy who's never walked before. And all of a sudden, he's walking around. They're going, wow, something Truly amazing is happening. So they recognize a miracle. And then they respond with the only way that they know how. And that is to worship Paul and Barnabas. You see, not too many years before this, local legend had it that the gods Zeus and Hermes had visited this village. That they came and they uh, they they came in the in the guise of some poor beggars, and they knocked on every door in the village and every door that they came to, they, they asked for food, they asked for hospitality, and everybody turned them away until they came to a little old couple, and that couple welcomed them into their house and showed them hospitality, and as a thank you to that couple, then then Zeus and Hermes take them up on a hill, and they spare their lives as they destroy the rest of the village, right, with a flood. And then they turn their little cottage into the temple of Zeus that's there, made of marble, and they make this couple the priest and the priestess to the cult Zeus. Now, why do I tell you that story? Glad you asked. You see, it gives you a little bit of the cultural context where they were coming from. It tells you a little bit of how, why they interpreted what Paul was doing, a miracle that happened, why all of a sudden they jumped to Zeus and Hermes. Why do they go there first? You see, they didn't want to be like their ancestors who were destroyed in the the village flood. It was better to be like the old couple and show hospitality to earn the favor of the gods rather than their wrath. And we have to stop there for just a second. You see, the Lystrans rightly recognize that a miracle has happened. Right? They see it and they go, yeah, uh uh-huh, okay, I got it. Something supernatural has happened here. But they misinterpret what that miracle means based on their cultural 
uh, lens on their worldview. They, they see it and, and their worldview tells them not that there's one God who created the heavens and the earth, not that there's one God who loves them and sent his son to die for them, but there's all kinds of gods and there's uh, Zeus and Hermes and if I don't want to get struck down, I better be nice to them. And I wonder for us how often our worldview causes us to misinterpret what God is doing in our lives. You see, I think for some of us, maybe our worldview is more influenced by the world than it is by God's Word. And when that happens, we become confused and we worship the wrong things. That when good things happen in our life, we tend to to want to worship those good things. Whether they're relationships or whether it's Uh, fortune or whether it's fame or whatever it might be, that that becomes a thing that we want to worship. Or on the flip side, if things uh, take a turn for the worse, then we become resentful and we point fingers at everybody else because it's all their problems. Moral of the story is, spend time in God's Word and let it determine your worldview and how you see things around you. Anyway, Paul and Barnabas don't speak Lycaonian. So they have no idea what's going on at first. They just hear these guys jabbering around. And then the next thing they know, here comes the priest of Zeus out of the temple. And not only is he walking out of the temple, he's got these oxen that he's leading out. And they have their garlands on them. And so now they realize they're coming to sacrifice these oxen to us. And they're horrified. They're horrified that these people would see them as gods and that they would want to worship him. And it's a very different response that that they have than what Herod had a few chapters before. Remember that when Herod was there and the people were chanting the voice of a god and not of a man, he's like, yeah, bring it on, bring it on. But not Paul and Barnabas. They're horrified. They rip their clothes. They run out and they try to stop them from sacrificing to them. And as they do, Luke records the first snippet of Paul's sermon to a purely pagan crowd. You see, they had no biblical foundation. They, they had no, this isn't the Old Testament, this isn't the synagogue, so they don't know who God is and they don't know who Jesus is. And so Paul has to, to come at them in a very different way. And so Paul starts off. Now, normally you wouldn't have to start off, I'm not a God, but Paul has to at this case because he's just done a miracle. And he says, we're no gods. We are just like you. And the gospel he preaches to them is, turn from these vain things to the living God, to the one who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Right, that he is, there's only one God and he is a living God. He's not like your dead idols who cannot see or hear or talk, much less save or deliver or rescue. There's only one God and he is the creator of all. It reminds me of when I was in Nepal a few years ago. In that area of the world, uh, it's still very Hindu. And so there's lots of idols and there's lots of temples all over the place. And we were there on a medical missionary trip, and so my job was, once folks saw the doctor and came out, was to share the gospel with them. That's kind of tricky when they have no concept of the Bible. You can say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and they would say, okay, which God are you talking about? Which one exactly are you talking about? And when I first started, I didn't catch this because I was like, man, all these people are trusting in Jesus. Isn't this awesome? And they said, you realize they're just adding Jesus to their millions of gods. He's just one more on a list of other gods that they worship. That changed the way that I began to talk about it. You see, I had to tell them that there's only one God, the creator of the universe, right? I said, look at the, these little mountains called the Himalayas, Right? Look at, look at the, the world that's around you. And I had to start from creation and say there is a God who made all of this. And I talk about sin in the garden and our failure there and that God had provided hope through a, a rescuer who had come, a guy named Jesus. And by believing in him and turning from vain things, you can have life. 
Paul says that in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. And yet, he did not leave himself without witness. Theologians talk about two kinds of revelation. There's special revelation and there's natural revelation. Special revelation just simply means this. It's the, uh, the Word of God. It's the Bible that you have in your hands. It means that God has spoke specifically to his people and he's given them his Word. The Old Testament is that revelation that was given to God's people, to the Jews, and, and their job was to be a light to the Gentiles, a kingdom of priests, so that all the families of the earth could be blessed. But somewhere along the way, that, that, that light that was given to them, the, the plan went off track, and, and all of a sudden that light was hidden, and it became their kind of thing. That's our truth. And see, that happens to us today. You know, that we as a church too often will take the truth and we hide it for ourselves. We, we hoard it for ourselves. And we'll say, to hell with the rest of the world. I really don't care. But this special revelation wasn't just for God's people at that time. It was for them to share with all people so that all might be saved. Not only there's special, but there's also natural revelation. And that's what can be known about God from the world that he created. Paul says in in Romans 1, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the, fo- image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. He goes on to say, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Any thinking person who looks at the stars in the sky, any thinking person who looks at the mountains that surround us or, or, or the rivers, or the oceans. Any thinking person who looks at the trees, or the grass, or the birds, or, or the dogs, or whatever else it is, any thinking person that looks at God's creation has no excuse to say there's not a God. How many of you have a phone? Like an iPhone or something? Maybe an Android. So, did you just take the parts and leave them on the ground one day and and all of a sudden it was a phone? It didn't happen for you that way? It wasn't an accident? You just tripped and all of a sudden everything fell down and all of a sudden it's a phone? We would think that's ridiculous, wouldn't we? And yet, God's creation is far more intricate than a phone. Way more sophisticated than a phone. And, and so to look at his creation and go, oh no, there's not a God. This is all an accident. It's, it's time, chance, and, and a bunch of goo, and we end up with this. No thinking person can say that. Honestly. That there is no God. But Paul says not only can they not come to that conclusion, but they can look at the rains that he gives them and the, the fruit of the ground that comes. He can look at those things and the gladness of heart, and he can say not only can they come to the conclusion that God exists, but he's also a good God. He provides enjoyment of life. And that's apart from the Bible. You can see that in the creation. But even when Paul says this, it's only with great effort that he and Barnabas are able to restrain the crowd. Even then, they won't listen. And can you imagine how frustrating that must have been for Paul? 
He rolls into a new town. He's, he wants to share the gospel and tell them about Jesus and the hope that they have. And he performs a miracle in every other place he's done that. It's confirmed his message, but now it has a very different response that instead of pointing people to Jesus, instead they're running the other way. Right? And it would have been easy for Paul to give up. It would have been easy for him to go, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. But Paul doesn't. He perseveres. And I wonder when you're misunderstood or when people misinterpret your good intentions, when you tell them the gospel and they reject it, do you give up? Or do you get up and press on? As frustrating as the response of the Lystrans might have been, things are about to get worse. Much worse. So these unbelieving Jews uh, that he ran into in first in Pisidian Antioch and then Iconium, they've made their way to Lystra. Now the ones from Iconium only travel about 18 miles, so if you figure you're walking or riding your donkey, that's probably a two to three day trip. Not too bad. Pisidian Antioch, that's over 100 miles. That's a much longer trip. That's a couple of weeks to get there, which is a a picture of the fanatical zeal that these folks have. It reminds us of Paul when he was going to Damascus, uh, breathing threats, wanting to destroy the church. And now this same kind of zeal is driving these other guys to come after Paul. Like he said earlier, like he said in Romans, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. These guys hate. I know you're not supposed to say it, but they do. They hate Paul. And when they get to town, they begin to stir up the mob. And so what was adoration, what was worship, what was excitement about about Paul and Barnabas quickly turns into this hostility and lethal force. Just like Stephen in Acts chapter 7, who was taken out and then stoned to death. A stoning was the Jewish way of killing someone who blasphemed. Now, here's the crazy thing. Had Paul and Barnabas accepted the worship of the folks there in Lystra, that would be blasphemy. But Luke makes it clear they're not being killed because <clears throat> they were making themselves God. They're being killed because of Jesus. That's who they're killed for. And no doubt when Paul is being, uh, stones are being hurled at him, he can't help but think of Stephen. Because remember, Paul was there standing watching the robes as though they were killing Stephen the same way. And then Paul's body is dragged outside of town and he's left for dead. But it's hard to keep a good man down. Right? And no doubt then another miracle takes place and Paul gets up and he walks right back into town. That's pretty amazing. And you thought you had a rough day, right? <laughs> but yeah, he, Paul, after, uh, not only is he misunderstood, not only is they misinterpret, but he's actually killed and then God, allow, or at least close to killed, and God brings him back to to face his opponents. Paul's visit to the little town of Lystra didn't go quite the way he had planned. Right? He thought that the healing of this lame man would be the thing that would point folks to Jesus and instead it goes sideways and, and now they're, they're continuing their pagan ways. And then added to that, when they start to stop that thing, then you have these unbelieving Jews that begin to stir up the the crowd, and they want to do away with Paul once and for all. You know, in the book of Acts, there's lots of success stories, and I love those stories. Thousands of people coming to faith in Jerusalem and in Samaria. I love the story of the conversion of, of Cornelius as the first Gentile, and, and of Saul on the road to Damascus, because it's a, a turning point in the book. I love that, Phil, uh, that Peter is rescued from Herod's clutches, and that Paul is able to face down Bar Jesus in this spiritual duel. I love it. The first chan- the uh, Gentile church planted in Antioch, and one of the first things they do is they send missionaries out to continue to share the gospel with the rest of the world, and lots of Gentiles come to faith. I love the success stories. Jesus had lots of those too. 
right, in his ministry as he ministered to different towns and he'd have lots of folks who would follow him at a time and, and lots of people who responded well. But then the opposition came, right? And then persecution came. And we talked about this last week. As much as we would hope it was otherwise, that really is the norm. Because some will accept Jesus, but most will reject. There will always be opposition to the gospel. Do you know why that is? Because you have a real enemy who doesn't like you storming his gates. You have a real enemy that doesn't want you kicking down his door. He doesn't like you messing with his stuff. He doesn't like you rescuing captives that are held bondage in his dominion. He doesn't like it one little bit. And so he will do anything and everything in his power to thwart your attempts. And sometimes they'll misunderstand you, and sometimes they will misinterpret what you're doing, and sometimes they will behave in very, very, very bad ways. But let's not give up. You see, we no longer live in a culture where you have these strong biblical moorings, right? At one point, not too many years ago, that that when you talked about Noah and the flood, or you talked about David and Goliath, people would actually understand what you were talking about. They may not know the Bible, but they knew some of the stories of the Bible. Now we can't assume that they have even a basic rudimentary understanding of what the Bible says, or knowledge of the Bible. And the sad thing is, that's not just out there. That's in here too. That's in here too. And unfortunately, many of us are more influenced by the anti-God, anti-Christian culture we live in than we are by God's Word. That we're more influenced by social media and what the news has to say and the talking heads. We're more influenced by uh, the movies that we watch and the TV shows that we stream. We're more influenced by what everybody else thinks and what everybody else says. We're more influenced by this culture than we are what God has to say. And it shouldn't be that way. And when that happens, we do become confused. And when that happens, we don't know which way to turn. And then when tragedy strikes in our life, we begin to misinterpret what God may be trying to do and how he wants to use you and how he wants to work through you. And I can tell you, when that's your worldview, here's the thing. We may be too sophisticated to believe in Zeus and Hermes, but we have our own idols. Right? We have our own idols. Success and fame. We have uh, the, uh, the goodwill of other people and a number of followers that we have. And, and money and, and, and materialism and uh, feeling good about ourselves. We have lots of other idols that we bow down to. So if that's you today, where do you start? God's Word. Right? You begin to read God's Word. And you do it every day until you start thinking differently. Right? That's the only thing that's going to change your, your, your thought patterns. That's the only thing that's going to change your outlook. That's the only thing that's going to uh, fix a warped and crooked worldview. You see, in this culture now, it is very difficult to share your faith. It's not like it used to be. You can't just jump out with John 3.16 because they don't accept what you're having to say, right? Oh, you're going to quote the Bible? I'll quote something else to you. It makes it difficult to live a Christian life, right? Because nobody else is. And the culture tells you that's okay. But it shouldn't cause us to give up. And it shouldn't cause us to go, oh well, right? I'm going to go home then. I'm going to just hide in my little huddle and I'm, uh, I'm going to protect myself and my family and that's it. No, it should cause us to, to, to lean into the Spirit more fully and to hold on to Jesus more desperately. It should cause us to get up and get back in the game. 
right? It should cause us to want to press on. Why? Why in the world would Paul do it? Why would he do it? I mean, Pisidian Antioch, things started to go south. Why go then to Iconium? Why would he do it? And then Iconium, they threatened to stone him. Why would he go to Lystra? Why would Paul do it? Because a love of God compels us. It compels us. Why would Jesus go to a cross? Because the love of God compelled him. And so why should we put ourselves out there? Why should we put ourselves on the line with those who are around us, those who have a front row seat to our lives? Because the love of God compels us to do that. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, today's the day. Turn from the vain things that you're pursuing. This week, two people pass from death, I mean from life to death, just like that. And they came face to face with Jesus. And when that happens, he's either your king or your judge. And you don't get a second shot at it. And for Robert, we know, for him, Jesus was his king. And so now he has a forever to spend with him. I don't know about the mom. I can just hope that she was a believer as well. But I don't know. Your life can change like that. And if you built it around vain things, if you're building it on things that, that don't last, then when those things come away, you're left with nothing but judgment. Make today the day. Jesus came, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, Lord, I thank you for the hard-headedness of Paul. He was hard-headed but not hard-hearted. That he had great compassion and, and even in the face of opposition and even when it would look to cost him his life, he followed his Savior. Because the love of God compelled him. The riches of your grace and of your mercy had such a profound impact on his life that he couldn't help but tell everybody. And so, Father, I pray for us. I pray that we would have that kind of zeal for you. That with those who have front row seats to our lives, that, Father, we would share the gospel when you give opportunity. That we would point them to Jesus every chance we get. That as the world is, becomes more and more chaotic every day as darkness tries to creep in, that, Lord, we would be lights that shine brightly and point folks to you. And, Father, for those in here that that maybe their worldview is more influenced by the culture than by your word, Lord, I pray that, that those who are your children, Father, would have a hunger and thirst for your righteousness. That they would start today and just start reading your word and spending time in it. And Lord, I pray for those who don't know you today, that Lord, today would be the day they turn from the vain idols and they turn to the living God. Who not only created the heavens and the earth, but who created them as well and loves them and wants them to experience life, real life that not only lasts today, but lasts when these bodies wear out and break down. I pray these things in Jesus' name.